Welcome to another episode of Living Faith. Today we're going to be discussing family habits that have been neglected. So before we start, I have a couple of questions that the inspiration has revealed to us. And they're found in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 423. My brethren, are you cultivating devotion? Is love of religious things prominent? Are you living by faith and overcoming the world? Do you attend public worship of God and are your voices heard in the prayer and social meetings? Is the family altar established? Do you gather your children together morning and evening and present their cases to God? Do you instruct them how to become followers of the Lamb? Your families, if irreligious, testify to your neglect and unfaithfulness. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we're here at this moment to understand what your desire is for families. Lord, we understand that we're reaching closer and closer to the end. And Father God, we want our families to be saved. But maybe there's a neglect on our part of things that we're not doing that you desire of us to do so that we can be saved and our whole families can be saved together with us. At this time, as we study your word, I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you put in the hearts and in the minds of those that are listening to be able to receive you and to understand clearly what you desire for our lives today. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible reveals of a prophet named Samuel, who at the time of his, his uh, existence, recognized the need for assistance with the families of the children of Israel. And God instructed him to institute a facility where he could assist the parents in raising up the children that wanted to be called by God, that wanted to be led closer to God. This was called the Schools of the Prophets. And listen what Education, page 45 and 46, tell us about these Schools of the Prophets. Through unfaithfulness in the home and idolatrous influences without, many of the Hebrew young received an education differing widely from that which God had planned for them. They learned the ways of the heathen. To meet this growing evil, God provided other agencies as an aid to parents in the work of education. From the earliest times, prophets had been recognized as teachers divinely appointed. In the highest sense, the prophet was one who spoke by direct inspiration communicating to the people the messages he had received from God. But the name was given also to those who, though not so directly inspired, were divinely called to instruct the people in the works and ways of God. Here we can see that God spoke directly to men who were divinely inspired by Him to teach the children of Israel according to His ways, how to follow in the path that he, he desired of them. But it also tells us that there were other men that were trained by these prophets, that were, that were instructed by these leaders to do the same work, to continue on in the work. These two were called prophets. And the reason why God instituted these schools was to assist parents in the time of need. Why were these parents needed to be assisted? Because they neglected, they were unfaithful in their home to instruct their children, to guide their children in the ways of the Lord. So maybe you're here today looking at your family and saying, well, there's always trouble, there's always problems, we're always arguing, or there's always stress, whatever it might be. Maybe you're seeking help. God, how can I get my children to follow you? How can I get my husband to seek after you? or my wife, to serve you in the way that you desire her, to honor you? How can the family be united? And you're trying and trying and trying, but you can't figure it out. You can't assist, you can't get your family together in Christ. This is why God has led me here today, to assist you, to be used by Him through the inspiration of the prophets to share with you what He has revealed for this time, for us to be ready to stand in the time of probation. You see, many of us, we live in our homes and we, we raise our children and we might have good intentions of trying to do the right things, 
of trying to lead our family in the right direction. But good intentions aren't always enough. They'll take us to a certain point, but that's as far as it'll go. And that is not enough to get us to where Christ wants us to be. It's not enough to have the home that God desired us to have, to have a little piece of heaven on earth, to feel and experience the blessings that God desires for us. Good intentions are not enough. So what do we do? How can we see that through the Bible, how it's not good enough? Well, we could look at the story of Lot. Remember we did a comparison between Noah and Lot and how Noah did a work of preparation and he incorporated his whole family. And because of that, him and his whole household was saved is what the Bible tells us. But when we look at Lot, we can see that only Lot was saved. His family was lost because he was convicted. He was converted in his own heart. But that conviction and that, that conversion, that, that desire for God never came out, was never a living faith out demonstrated to his family. And that is why his family was lost. So as we get closer and closer to the end, we don't want to be the people experiencing the same things that Lot experienced. So how do we do that? We prepare today so that we don't have to worry about tomorrow. What was Lot's in example for us? What can we learn through the life of Lot? The Adventist home, page 138, tells us, When Lot entered Sodom, he fully intended to keep himself free from iniquity and to command his household after him. But he signally failed. The corrupting influences about him had an effect upon his own faith, and his children's connection with the inhabitants of Sodom bound up disinterest in a measure with theirs. The result is before us, Many are making a similar mistake. Here we can see that Lot had good intentions when he moved into the city of Sodom. He had good intentions, but the influences that were surrounding him corrupted his ability to have an influence on his family. The connection that his children had with the, the other children or the community around him was so strong that it was breaking the, the ties and the bands that he had together with his family. Maybe we need to consider, are our connections being severed with our children or with our loved ones simply because of the location we choose to live in? We'll discuss this a little further as we go along. But look at what Patriarchs and Prophets, page 578 tells us. Those who follow their own inclination, in blind affection for their children, indulging them in the graceful gratification of their selfish desires, and do not bring to bear the authority of God to rebuke sin and correct evil, make it manifest that they are honoring their wicked children more than they honor God. We can look in today's age that parents have neglected to a great extent the, the requirements that God has on their children. For example, we can look at fathers who go out to work and they're so preoccupied with their business and their, their ability to provide financially for their family that when they get home, they're so drained out, so exhausted that they, they don't have any efforts or energy to entertain their children. So what do they do? They just, they just throw them the remote and sit them in front of the couch and say, here, watch, watch this show. Go keep yourself occupied while I rest. We can also see in other instances where family members, when they're, let's say they go to the grocery store, a mother goes with their children to the grocery store and the kids are overreacting. They're getting very hyper, very antsy and irritated. So the mother will say, here, take this candy so you can calm down. But what is it gonna, what's the candy going to do? It's just going to stimulate the children even more. Inspiration tells us that when we indulge in the children's gratifications, in what the kids want, and we keep constantly doing that over and over again, what we're doing is we're showing that we're manifesting and we're honoring them and their wickedness higher than we honor God. When we allow the children to indulge in things that are contrary to the will of God and desires of God and manifesting a, an example within their own lifestyle habits that are contrary to the character that God requires of them to have, we are showing, showing that we honor them above God. Is that what we want to display 
to our family home, in our family home? Is that what we want God to see represented in our lives today? That we honor our family members more than we actually honor God? For most parts, for most people out in the world today, or for most men, let's, let's speak about the men for now. We can say that they are, for the most part, businessmen, good businessmen, where they can run vast majorities of, of, um, of, of people or crews for, for business, whatever it might be in their business. And they, they can organize and they can coordinate and delegate a lot of different things when they're at work. And then when they come to home, the home life, they fall apart. They don't know how to run their own home. So I would call those people businessmen and not family men. But is a businessman going to be able to save his family going up to heaven? I don't think so. But when we look at the family, and when we see a family man, then we can see the example of how to lead out a home. And we're going to learn also that men that are able to lead out their home have greater success out in the business world and out in society than those that appear to have success right now when their homes are falling apart. So what looks as though it's successful in one sense is actually not as successful as God can make it if you were successful within the home first. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 15 verse 27. It tells us this, He that is greedy of gain trouble troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. Being greedy for gain. This is, this is men that have such a, a, a desire or striving so much to accumulate wealth, to accumulate the, the pleasures of this world, the treasures of this world, and they work constantly over and over again. They might have one job, two jobs, three jobs, work over the weekends in order to sustain the lifestyle they've, that they've built for their family and for their home, for the conveniences, for the comfort that they have today. Well, the Bible tells us that this greed for gain troubles the home. So when we're so focused on work that it takes away the ability for us to spend time in the home, focusing on the home, we're troubling that home. We're causing trouble in that home. But look at what Proverbs 11 verse 29 tells us. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. What is this wind that the Bible is telling us? So those that are focused more on their, their gains, the financial success, their abilities to achieve more things in this world. They're troubling their home. They're causing conflicts within the home. The, the connection between parent and child or spouse, between spouses, it's, it's becoming distant. And the Bible tells us that they're going to inherit the wind. What is this wind that uh, people that only focus on their, their jobs are going to receive? Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 tells us what this wind is. Let's look at it right now. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. The Bible is telling us that there's four angels surrounding this world, holding back the tides, the winds of destruction. And if we are to focus solely on the achievements that we're gaining in this world, we're going to end up, as we progress further and further into the end times, we're going to end up on the side that is on, on the, the destruction of God's hand. When God releases the winds, when God releases the winds, all that you're able to receive is the, the consequences of the lifestyle you chose. So let us focus a little less on accumulating treasures here on this earth and gaining the treasures for heaven. The things that we can bring up with us is just our character and our family members. We're not going to be able to bring our home. We're not going to be able to bring our cars or our, our, our beautiful furniture or whatever it might be that we have achieved here on this earth. But we can bring our children with us. We can bring our spouses with us. But there's a work of preparation to do in order for us to go together hand in hand with our families. Are you willing to do that work today? Are you willing to separate yourselves from the things that are, are taking your attention, taking your time away from the family, taking your time away from the things that are important? Let's look at some of those things because we can see in the Bible and through the spirit of prophecy that there are many men, many families that are written in scriptures that delayed the efforts that were necessary 
And because they delayed their efforts in doing what God called them to do, there were consequences. And those consequences were, were drastic. And they were never able to recover from those consequences. And I'm here to try and share with you guys some of the lessons that we can learn from them so that we don't have to experience those same consequences. We don't have to suffer in the same way that they did if we learn and heed the warnings that God has given to us. Adventist Home, page 319, tells us, Where there is a lack of home religion, a profession of faith is valueless. Many are deceiving themselves by thinking that the character will be transformed at the coming of Christ. But there will be no conversion of heart at His appearing. Our defects of character must be here, must here be repented of. And through the grace of Christ, we must overcome them while probation shall last. This is the place for fitting up for the family above. And now is our time. Now is the opportunity that God has given us to do a work of preparing our homes. See, it's not enough for us to just say, I'm a Christian, or we go to church, or we believe in the Bible, and we, do, we say these, all these wonderful things, but yet in our example, in the lifestyle we live, we're manifesting something completely different, something completely contrary to what the Bible teaches. Our profession of faith is valueless unless we have living faith. So do you have living faith? in the Word of God, in your home today. Because if you don't, the consequences will be great. Let's look at some of the consequences at this time. Look at Patriarchs and Prophets, page 160. It tells us, Lot went out to warn his children. He repeated the words of the angel, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Because he seemed to them as one that mocked, they laughed at what they called his superstitious fears. His daughters were influenced by their husbands. They were well enough off where they were. They could see no evidence of danger. Everything was just as it had been. Here's the first consequence that Lot experienced. He experienced the loss of influence over his family members. When the angels came into his home and told them, get out of the city because God is going to destroy this city. He said, I need to go after my family members. And he called to his daughters that already were of a, a, an older age, that had already married and have left the house. He tried to reach out to his family members. And the daughters were more influenced by their husbands, by the, the people that weren't connected with God than the father. So do you want to be at a, at a point in your life when God calls you to do certain things, to prepare, to leave certain things, to let go of certain things, and you try and reach out to your family members, say, this is the time to change. This is the time to let go of this or let go of that and start converting our hearts, uh, uh, fearing God, giving glory to Him, doing things in a different way, and yet your family members will turn to you and say, I don't see anything changing. Everything is still the same as what it was and they're more influenced by other people around them than you yourself. This is the first consequence that, that Lot experienced. And what is the second? It's found in uh, the following paragraphs. It continues by saying this, But Lot delayed. Through daily distress, though daily distressed at beholding deeds of violence, he had no true conception of the debased and abominable iniquity practice in that vile city. He did not realize the terrible necessity for God's judgment to be to put a check on sin. Some of his children clung to Sodom, and his wife refused to depart without them. And the thought of leaving the, those whom he held dearest on earth seemed more than he could bear. It was hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labor of his whole life, to go for a destitute wanderer, stupefied with sorrow, he lingered. Here we can see that Lot lost the influence of his children, but he also lost interest for God. The family lost interest for God. The Bible, inspiration tells us that Lot delayed had he been more concerned with the things of God, had he put God first above everything else in his life, 
that interest, that fervor, that, that passion, that zeal, that, that, uh, that earnestness to move would, ha- would not have been lost. But because he lost interest, because of the influences surrounding him, he lost interest himself. His families lost interest. The, the inspiration tells us that his children clung to Sodom. They were more interested in the things that the city provided, the city offered them, than the things that God offered them. The consequences that we will face if we choose not to run our home in accordance with the guidelines that God has instructed is that family members may lose interest at a crucial moment, at the crucial time. And when that time comes, we may not have the influence to be able to guide them and bring them back, to pull them out of the world and to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. Do you want to face those consequences of family members losing interest and losing the influence on your family members? Well, God is giving us an opportunity now to do the work necessary so that we don't uh, fall short during that time with our family members. There's one final uh, consequence that Lot faced, and it's found in page 161 of Patriarchs and Prophets. She tells us this, If Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had earnestly fled toward the mountains without one word of pleading or remonstrance, his wife also would have made her escape. The final consequence that Lot faced, that Lot experienced in that time of, of trial was the loss of family members. First, he lost the ability to have influence on them. They lost interest in the things of God. And then ultimately, he ended up losing out on his own family. These are the lessons we learn when we choose to delay the work of God in our homes. When we choose not to follow in the precepts, the guidelines that God has instructed us to to have within our home. The Bible in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 tells us this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Here we can see through scriptures another consequence. You see, Lot tried to reach out to his family. But because of the condition of the world, because of the sin that separated them from God, the Bible tells us that children will be disobedient to parents. The children were disobedient to their parents at that time. And it continues on from generation to generation. It keeps getting worse and worse. And maybe you can see that in your own home today, where you're trying to lead your home, your family in in one direction. But the sins that are consuming them, absorbing their thoughts in their minds, the influences surrounding them are just causing them to disobey you over and over again. Is there hope for you? Is there something that you can do to change that atmosphere in your home and to bring it to an atmosphere where the Spirit of God enjoys to dwell, where the angels of God enjoy to to be uh, surrounded by that atmosphere. There are things that can be done, even at this very crucial time, but they must be done with earnestness, with fervor, down on our knees praying for the strength and help of God to get you through them. You see, because if we don't do the work, now that is necessary for us to do to bring our home our families back to where God desired and intended someone is going to be held accountable for the loss of the interest the loss of influence and ultimately the loss of family members because of sin someone's going to be held accountable for that they'll their accountability their consequences will be that they'll be lost forever but inspiration teaches us that if you know better if you know their direction and the counsels of God that God will one day hold you accountable for the things that you chose not to do when you had the opportunities to do things that God desired and God called you to do. Let's look at what, the, what Patriarchs and Prophets, page 578, tells us. Those who have too little courage to reprove wrong or who through in, indulgence or lack of interest make no earnest efforts to purify the family or the church of God 
are held accountable for the evil that, they may res that may result from their neglect of duty. We are just as responsible for evil that we might have checked in others by exercise of parental or pastoral, pastoral authority as if the act had been our own. Inspiration is sharing with us that we who know better, who understand the scriptures, who have been led by God as Lot was, we will be held accountable for the loss of our family members. God will view their sins as though we ourselves were committing them because we didn't have enough courage to say no to certain faults, to, to correct, to, to reprove our family members when they were going in the wrong direction. Yes, it might be difficult to say no at times. It might be hard to neglect certain desires that our family members might want or to reprove certain actions or attitudes. It might be difficult. But if we don't do the work necessary that God calls us to do today, God is going to look at us as though we ourselves were committing those same sins. Because earlier, remember we read that if we make it manifest that we honor our wicked children above honoring God when we allow them to continue indulging in the sinful habits of this world. She continues in page 579 of Patriarchs and Prophets by saying this, there is no greater curse upon households than to allow the youth to have their own way. When parents regard every wish of their children and indulge them in what they know is not for their good, the children soon lose all respect for their parents and regard the authority of God or man and are led captive at the will of Satan. The greatest curse we can put upon our home and our, our family is by allowing them, the children, to do what they want, to live as they please. Because what's actually going to happen is they lose all respect for the parents. And sometimes we think, if I keep saying no, keep saying no, not allowing them to do this, not allowing them to go there, then they're going to they're gonna rebel and they're going to turn away from me and they're going to want to do their own thing. But really what inspiration is telling us is the very opposite. If we hold them in check, if we create boundaries for our, our family, if we create boundaries for our children and say, these are the limitations, this is the guidelines, the barrier that God has placed us in. You're not permitted to do these cer certain things. You're not permitted to watch these, these certain shows or listen to these certain things or go to these, these specific places. If we don't do those, if we don't create limitations for our children, soon they will grow up to disrespect us because we just allow them to do whatever they, they please. They will disrespect us and dishonor God as well. And we think, okay, I can live with that because when they grow older, they'll, they'll, they'll come back because the Bible teaches us to, to raise up a child in the way he goes. And when he grows old, he will not depart. So maybe when they get older, they'll, they'll come back to their senses and come back to God. But what inspiration teaches us is that when we allow them to do their own thing, where we're placing them is to be led captive by Satan. So we're actually letting go of our children and putting them in the hands of the enemy, putting them in under his authority and binding them to the enemy to be lost forever. Is that what you want for your children? To be bound by Satan in this world, full of temptation and distress and despair? And, th and then we wonder why our children um, are all under, always under stress or given to peer pressure or always frustrated and agitated because they're bound by the enemy. And we are to blame for that by allowing them to indulge in certain habits that had led them closer and closer to the ways of this world. Psalms 103 verse 17 and 18 tell us this, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto children's children to such as keep His covenant, and to those that remember His commandments to do them. Here there's a beautiful promise that there is hope for families. But that hope and that mercy that God extends isn't for everyone. If you go back to the previous studies we had on living faith, we can learn that the mercy of God is only for those who take shelter in the covenant of God, which is found within the sanctuary, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, those that receive mercy from God, that God will, 
assist you at this time of, of neglect is those that choose to seek after His righteousness. Those that remember His commandments and choose to do them. So what is this telling us? It's people that today, that recognize that they've made mistakes. Maybe you've made mistakes and you want to change. You want your family to be turned back and led back to, to the arms of God. Well, we must remember to follow Him by living faith. When we extend that living faith in our home, in our own life, the Bible says that God will have mercy on you and He will assist you to bring your family back to the fold. His righteousness will extend upon you and that righteousness will reflect out of you to your children. It says, His righteousness unto children's children. So it's from one generation to the other, His righteousness will cover. So God could look on your faults and say, if you, if you come back to me, I'll have mercy on you. I'll give you my righteousness if you follow in my ways. And that will lead to your children following in the same direction. But you must do it through living faith. Have faith that I can help you. Have faith that I could change the, the ways that your home has been led and bring you back to the ways that I desired. Manuscripts, Volume 5, page 428, tells us that a turning around from our lifestyle, a turning around from the home atmosphere that's negative, can be, uh, be turned into something good even though bad consequences have taken place. Let's see what it says here. Parents, the Lord has shown me that if you wish to save your children, here's what must be done. Separate them from the world. Keep them from other wicked children. Subdue their tempers and evil passions. Teach them to obey you. Then they can more easily obey the commandments of God. After you have done your duty, carry your children to God and plead His blessing upon them. He that said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, will be ready to listen to your prayers for them, and the seal or mark of the believing parent will cover the children if they are brought upright. If parents neglect their duty and leave their children to indulge in wicked evil passions, the destroying angel will cut them down, and you parents will have an awful account to give for the neglect of your children. You who have not done your duty, now awake and redeem the time. It is but short, but you can work faithfully and can do much for your children. Inspiration is teaching us today that we as parents, you as parents who have neglected to do the work that God called you to do in your home with your children, that God is saying to come back to redeem that time, to reprove your children, to correct them, to teach them to obey you and to teach them to obey God. And after you do your part, everything that you can possibly do to bring your children back to God, then she says, go down on your knees and seek the Lord. Pray for your children. You see, you can do everything in your power to try and bring them back. And that is still not enough. You can do everything right in your own strength and that is not enough. I know of many people within the church, they can be leaders, they can be elders, they can be even pastors that had their children brought up in the church and for some reason they've been led away out into the world. And these parents keep, keep pleading, why are my kids not coming back? Time is short and they don't care about this world. And they try and do everything possible they try and preach to them, try and teach to them, try and correct them, try and reprove them. But everything, all their efforts are meaningless, are use, useless until we recognize that we need to connect our efforts with God through prayer. Because it's the Spirit of God that is going to enter into them to convert their hearts, to bring them back to Him, not us not the work we do, but it's through, it's through our living faith, the example that we share to them that can remind them of the love of God, that shows them a difference of what this world is, is giving to them and what God can offer to them. So plead to God for your children is what she tells us. A change in the home can happen. 
And we could see in Messages to Young People, page 337, how this happens. By earnest prayer and living faith, great victories will be gained. So here we see living faith, our example to our children, connected with our earnest prayers to God of lifting them before the throne of God each and every single day. The victories will be gained one by one, one at a time, each and every single day. They'll be drawn closer and closer to God. This is what, what God requires of us. Let's continue. Some parents have not realized the responsibility resting upon them and have neglected the religious education of their children. Let's pause here for a second. You know, in today's world, we see a lot of parents that are so concerned, so focused with giving their kids a high education, a good education. You want them in the best schools. You want them surrounded by the, be the smarter children, the best, the best abilities to be able to achieve greatness in this world. But many times, we ourselves put so much focus and effort in the education of our children for them not to look like fools in this world. But in God's eyes, they look like fools because we've neglected to give them the greatest education, the education of their spiritual walk with God. So God wants us to put more focus on their spiritual education that's, that they're going to be able to take up with them into heaven than the education that this world offers. What education are you giving to your kids? What education are you spending more effort and more time on? Is it the education of this world or the education that God desires for you to give to your children? She continues, Christians first thought should be upon God. Worldly labor and self-interest should be secondary. Children should be taught to respect and reverence the hour of prayer. Before leaving the house for labor, all the family should be called together and the father or the mother in the father's absence should plead fervently with God to keep them through the day. God wants to lead us to the saving of our household, not just to the saving of ourselves. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 says this, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your house will be saved. It doesn't say believe in Jesus Christ. And for many of us, we, we can think, well, that's the same thing. But really it's not. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in Jesus Christ are two different things. It's the same thing as when I said previously in, in our other uh, messages on living faith, that believe, having faith in Jesus is different than having the faith of Jesus. One is um, thinking that God is going to do all the work to save, save us and to save our families. The other one is having faith that God has the ability to do the work of transformation in my life and in the life of my family. But that faith is demonstrated through my actions. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing the work. I'm, I'm taking part in the work. I'm connecting myself with God in the efforts to save myself and my family. I'm not waiting on just God to do everything for me, but I'm taking part in the work myself. It's, it's the work of sanctification daily, day by day, doing what is necessary in my life to accept God daily and to bring my family to the fold daily. You see, for many of us, we're so focused on providing for our families. Whether it be father or mother, we, spend, we absorb our thoughts and our efforts, our energies in providing for the family. And that's a very important thing. The Bible even teaches and counsels that we should be doing those things. But look at what 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 tells us. But if, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So the Bible is telling us that if we don't provide for our family, we deny the faith. So how is it that I'm here telling you that what's more important is to focus on the family and not on the work? Because here the Bible is saying we have to provide for our family. It's important. It's vital. But what this is really saying is not so much about the physical provisions for the family. Those are necessary. But that's not what's going to cause us to deny the faith. It's the spiritual provisions for the family that causes us to deny the faith. You see, 
the greatest work that we need to do in our home is to provide spiritually for our family. And that is by gathering the family each morning to worship at the altar of God. Gathering each member of the family in the evenings to come before God and praise Him for all the blessings He's, sh He's given to us throughout that day. It's daily having faith in uh, providing a spiritual nourishment for the children, a spiritual nourishment for the wife and for all the members of the household. This is the provision that God requires us to do as men of God, as women of God when the father is absent, when the husband is absent in the home. God wants us to provide spiritually for the home as well as the physical uh, provision. <clears throat> Patriarchs and Prophets tells us um, something that's very interesting of a man who was very successful. He, he grew to uh, the highest authority within all of society. And maybe some of the, the workers out there can relate. When you're striving to increase in your position at work, and you gain respect by all your colleagues out there. But then you come into your home and you don't receive the same respect by, by your children or by your wife or by your husband. And you say, why, why waste my time? I'd rather be out there working because they respect me more than my own family. Well, look at the story of Eli. Let's look at what patriarchs and prophets, page 575 tell us. Eli was an, an indulgent father Loving peace and ease, he did not exercise his, his authority to correct the evil habits and passions of his children. Rather than contend with them or push them or punish them, he would submit to their will and give them their own way. Instead of regarding the education of his sons as one of the most important of his responsibility, he treated the matter as of light consequence. Here we can see that Eli did like all other businessmen, not family men do. He focused more on the things surrounding him. He didn't care too much about the, the habits and characteristics of his children. And it tells us that he treated it as like consequence, of no value. He didn't put an, more effort on the education, the spiritual education of his children. But he focused more on the... the um, how would I say it, their, their, their work abilities because they, they were to take in the next phase of the work of the priests and he was focusing more on how to train them in the, in the field than to train them for God. You see, he caused something great to be sacrificed and that sacrifice was the salvation of his family. And many of us today we're sacrificing the salvation of our family members for things that are meaningless. Look at what uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 162, tells us. We should beware of treating lightly God's gracious provisions for our, our salvation. There are Christians who say, I do not care to sa be saved unless my companion and children are saved with me. They feel that heaven would not be heaven to them without the presence of those who are so dear. But have those who cherish this feeling a right conception of their own relation to God in view of His great goodness and mercy toward them? Have they forgotten that they are bound to the strongest ties of love and honor and loyalty to the service of their Creator and Redeemer? The invitations of mercy are addressed to all. And because our friends reject the Savior's pleading love, shall we also turn away? The redemption of soul is precious. Christ had paid an infinite price for our salvation and no one who appreciates the value of offered who appreciates the value of offered mercy because others choose to do so the very fact that others are ignoring his just claims should arouse us to greater diligence that we may honor God ourselves Both Lot and Eli demonstrated poor examples of how to lead out your homes. Look at what uh, inspiration tells us in page 168 of Patriarchs and Prophets. Leaving Abraham's altar and its daily sacrifice to the living God, he had permitted his children to mingle with a corrupt and idolatrous people. Yet, 
he had retained in his heart the fear of God, for he is declared in the Scriptures to have been a just man. You see, the inspiration tells us that because Lot chose to separate from Abraham, it caused his children and his wife to be influenced by the surroundings of where they went. And they neglected uh, the family altar, the altar that Abraham resur uh, erected for the family to all be gathered together to God, to worship God. They neglected that. They, they went away from it. They separated from it. And Lot never instituted a new altar in his home. So the worship of God was neglected. We can also learn a lesson here, a comparison, a difference between country living and city living or city influence. Country influence versus city influence. When they were in the country, they were led by a man of God who erected that altar, who made sure that everyone within his household was there to worship God, was present, was active in the worship of God. But when he separated himself, he was influenced by other communities, influenced by other ideas, other philosophies, and that caused him to neglect that uh, erection of the altar, to neglect their ties, their time, their efforts in studying the Word of God, in praying, in practicing the, the principles and guidelines of, of God. We can look in our lives today. For you who live in the city, the city creates so much distractions for your life that it's so hard to find time to study, to find time to gather together in the home and pray and worship God. You're so busy with work. You're so busy with trying to create um, activities for your children to be occupied that you don't have time for God. But if you were to move to the country, a lot of those influences would disappear. A lot more time would be granted to your life to be able to spend with your family out in nature, to experience God, to appreciate and value the things that God surrounds you with. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 168 and 169 says this, Many are still making similar mistakes in selecting a home they look more for the temporal advantages they may gain than the moral and social influences that will surround them and their families. They choose a beautiful and fertile country or remove to some flourishing city in the hope of securing greater prosperity. But their children are surrounded by temptations and too often they form associations that are unfavorable to the development of piety and the foundation of a right character. What are you doing in the cities? God is saying near, near and near to the end that we need to come out of the cities, move into the countries where we can be closer to God, hear more of God and receive less of the influences of this world. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 174, tells us this, that the wife of Lot was a selfish, irreligious woman and her influence was exerted to separate her husband from Abraham. No one who fears God can without danger connect himself with one who fears him not. The happiness and prosperity of the marriage relation depends upon the unity of the parties. But between the believer and the unbeliever, there is a radical difference of tastes, inclinations and purposes. They are serving two masters between whom there can be no concord. However pure and cor correct one's principle may be, the influence of an unbelieving companion will have a tendency to lead away from God. Here's the character contrary to living faith. And we could see it demonstrated in the life of Lot's wife. She was irreverent, irreligious. She didn't care about God. She wasn't concerned with God. And because of that, it created a, a division in the home between the father and the mother. And that division made it more difficult for, for Lot to exercise living faith, to exercise the principles and the guidelines of God in his home. And because of that, he lost the influence. His children lost interest and he lost his family. We are called as men of God to command our home. This is the role that God instituted for the men in the home. We see this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 575. Eli was a priest and judge in Israel. He held the highest and most responsible position among all the people of God. 
as a, ma as a man divinely chosen for the sacred duties of the priesthood and, and set over the land as the highest juridical authority. He was looked up to as an example and he welded a great influence over the tribes of Israel. But although he had been appointed the governor of the people, he did not rule his own household. When we look and study the life of Eli, we can see that he was admired by all the people around him. But in his own home, he was a failure. They didn't respect him, they didn't honor him, and they didn't care for what he said to them. He did not command his home. But we could look at an opposite person, Abraham, who led his full household. Genesis 18 verse 19 says this, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justly, do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Abraham did everything to bring all that dwelt in his house to the throne of God, to the altar of God. But Eli didn't. What are you doing today to the saving of your house? Maybe you're saying, I'm doing everything possible. Everything that I think is, is what I'm doing is good enough. Look at what Luke 3 verse 8 and 9 tells us. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and, bring, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to of these stones raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the tree. Every tree that therefore which bringeth not fruit bringeth forth not bringeth forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. See, we can't say that I'm doing enough or I'm doing my part. The Bible instructs us that we need to bear fruit. So look at the lives of our children. If they're not demonstrating the characteristics that God requires of them, then we're not bearing fruit. We're not really doing what God required of us, what God desires of us. We're not living, maybe we're not living out faith, we're not living the example, or maybe we're not pleading before the Lord to, for our children. There might be something missing, and we need to earnestly seek after what God desires so that they are not cut off from the tree. Pictures from Prophets, page 578, tells us this, Eli did not manage his household according to God's rule for family government. He followed his own judgment. The fond father overlooked the faults and sins of his sons and their children. Let's move further along. Many are now making a similar mistake. They think they know a better way of training their children than that which God has given in his word. They say, they are too young to be punished. Wait till they become older and can be reasoned with. Thus, wrong habits are left to strengthen until they become second nature. If we wait to do the work God called us to do of correcting our children from the bad habits of this world and say they're still young, they don't understand, when they get older then I'm really going to teach them the lessons. By then it's too, too late because they've developed those, neg those evil habits and they become second nature. It's part of them. It's part of their character. And a greater work is needed to be done to correct at that time. It's time for us to change our habits. It, uh, it's time for us to, to look to God and follow in His paths, in His directions. Not to try and think that we can do things ourselves or do, or do things our own way. It's time to follow God or else you're going to lose the loved ones around you. Do things His way and not our own way. Page 166 of Patriarchs and Prophets gives us a comparison of several different men and several different time frames. And it shows us that nothing changes. There was a coming out, a decided separation from the wicked, an escape for life. So it was in the days of Noah, so it was with Lot. So it was with the disciples prior to the destruction of, the Jeru of Jerusalem, and so it will be in the last days. Again, the voice of God is heard in a message of warning, bidding His people separate themselves from the prevailing iniquity. God is calling us to separate our ourselves from this world. 
Noah separated himself. Lot was called and, and uh, forced out of the city to separate himself, to save himself. The Israelites during the time of destruction also were called to separate themselves. And we today are called to separate ourselves from the ways of this world. Separate ourselves, but to where? To who? How? How do we do that? The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 and 7, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou, uh, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest, and that when thou liest down and when thou raisest up. We need to be communicating of God at all times in our home. When we wake up, when we're busy about doing our things, when we go to bed, all the time when we're relaxing, when we're working, at every single time we need to speak of God. We need to interact with God. You know, many I hear many parents that say, I put my kids in, in school because I, I can't handle them. It, when they're at home, like... The, the mothers, they say, they drive me crazy. I, I feel like ripping my hair and their hair, hair is all messy. They're just like completely overwhelmed with the reaction of the children. And, and they, they say, how is it possible for you to do homeschooling? I can't even handle my children for the two, three hours after school until bedtime. How do you do it? How do the mothers do it? And you know, for many of them, they're so focused on, uh, you know, the outward appearance. And, and all I can say is that when you put your children in the worldly schools, the worldly school systems, and they come home, and you're, you're so overwhelmed, it's because you're having to do, put double efforts to correct the errors that the school has brought into them, the influences that the world has brought into them. And that's why you feel like your hairs are all, all over the place and you're just, you're just falling apart. But when you do things according to the principle, principles of God, let's say you homeschool, you're not so worried with the outward physical appearance. But what you're going to see demonstrated in the, the tiredness of a mother. Yeah, maybe her hair might look sometimes a little messy because there's a lot going on in the home. But you can almost see the stars on the crown of that mother. Because what she's doing, she's doing a work of preparation. A work that's guiding her kids, leading them to the heavenly kingdom. And not to this earthly throne where they're going to gain success in this world but lose eternal success. We need to restore the habits of strengthening faith within our homes. And it's found in Luke chapter 1 verse 13 to 17 where it says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit of Elias, and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient wisdom to the wisdom of the just, and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was called in a time to prepare people for the first coming of Jesus. And this preparation was to bring unity to the families, the fathers to the children and the children to the just. It was a, a call of unity to prepare people for the first coming of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that the same spirit of Elijah will come in the second, in the end times to prepare people for, for the Lord, to make a people ready for the Lord. So God is calling us to have that same spirit to prepare where? To prepare who? The family, to unite the family to bring the family back together, to restore peace and harmony within the home. This is the work that God is calling us to do, to live out in faith, to start within our own homes so that we can ultimately, after our home is united, be a reflection of God, of unity, of Christ, unity with Christ out into the world so they can see what that unity looks like. Amos chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 tells us this, I have overthrown some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God. The Bible is teaching us that Israel was not following after the ways of God, 
But God had mercy, so He pulled them out. He gave them, them an opportunity, but they, they didn't take advantage of that opportunity. So He says He's going to do a work, and this work is going to cause them to prepare to meet their God. We're at a time where God had mercy on us for so long, and yet many of us have neglected the opportunities, the time that's been given to us with our homes, with our families. But God is saying, I'm going to do a work now, and this work is going to cause you to prepare to meet me. On one hand, there may be consequences. On the other hand, there may be salvation. But the choice is yours. Proverbs 12 verse 7 tells us this, The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. So we see here that only those that are overthrown are wicked. But if we choose to be righteous, choose to follow after the ways of God, we will be able to stand, us and our homes. Adventist Home, page 212, says this, The Father will bind His children to the throne of God by living faith. Distrusting His own strength, He hangs His helpless soul on Jesus and takes hold of the strength of the Most High. Brethren, pray at home, in your family, night and morning, Pray earnestly for your in your closet and while engaging in your daily labor, lift up the soul to God in prayer. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. The silent, fervent prayer of the soul will rise like holy incense to the throne of grace and will be acceptable to God as offered in the sanctuary. If we want to be able to guide our family in the direction of God, we must be a good example, an example of our living faith, not just speaking, but living it out. But it's not enough to just say, yeah, I'm going to have living faith, I'm going to pray to them. We need to have consistency also. It's something that we have to do on a regular basis, each and every single day. Adventist homepage 322 tells us, children must see in the lives of their parents that consistency which is in accordance with their faith. By leading a consistent life and ex exercising self-control, parents may mold the, children's the character of their children. So if you want to lead your children in the right direction, you must first have consistency in your own life. Don't expect our, our children to be led and into perfection if we ourselves aren't consistent in, in doing the things that God instructed us to do. Education page 128, 187 sorry, says this, In order to interest our children in the Bible, we ourselves must be interested in the Bible. To awaken in them a love for the study, we must love it. Our interaction to them will have only the weight of influence given it by our own example and spirit. We need to show them how to live out the the precepts of God within our own lives and we need to desire it also for ourselves it's not enough to say I want my kids to to be to live correctly but then we ourselves don't live correctly we need to love it desire it seek after God ourselves and then they'll follow they'll see in our example testimonies to the church volume 5 page 424 says this fathers and mothers who make God their fir first in their households who teach their children that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, glorify God before the angels and before men by presenting to the world a well-ordered, well-disciplined family, a family that loves and obeys God instead of rebelling against Him. Two things here that the family that, um, that pleases God does. First, they're well-ordered and they're also well-disciplined. There's a transforming power when we express living faith in our home. It, we demonstrate order and we demonstrate discipline within our lives, within the lives of every, every member of the household. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 to 3 says this, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we, we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, 
for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. We might not see the transforming work that God is doing in our lives today. We might not see the transforming work that God is doing in the lives of our children today. But if we consecrate ourselves, if we purify ourselves, if we live out the faith that we believe God will do, that time will come where we will be changed. Our homes will be changed. And it will reflect the image and the desire of God in our lives. The family circle is something so vital. It's something so vital to, to create that, that, that closeness, that, that connection with God, that unity within the family. You see, many people, they, they criticize their children to other people or they criticize their spouse to other people. And it's like there's, there's, no, there's no respect within the home. There's no protection within the home. But look at what Matthew 18 verse 20 says. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So if we unite in prayer, we can have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And if the Spirit of God is dwelling in us, we're not going to be criticizing each other. We're not going to be condemning each other to our friends or to our, our co-workers or whatever it might be. We're not going to be venting to others about the situations at home. We'll be uniting. We'll be protecting the, the characteristics of our family members. We'll be supporting each other. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 tells us this, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Adventist Home, page 245, continues with a similar thought. By faithfulness in your own home, working for the souls of those who are nearest to you, you may be gaining a fitness to work for Christ in a wider field. But be sure that those who are neglectful of their duty in the home circle are not prepared to work for other souls. My appeal for you today is found in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 and 16. And it might sound strange as an appeal, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain why this is the appeal. When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. Whoso heareth, let him have understanding. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountain. Here's the appeal to you. And here's my plea to you. There's a time necessary for us to flee into the mountains. There's going to be a, a physical preparation of fleeing to the mountains. That's coming in the near future. Similar to that of Lot where the angels called him and pushed him out into the mountain to save his life. Flee for his life is what they said. Flee to the mountains. But there's also a spiritual fleeing to the mountains. And before we flee physically during the time of persecution, we must first flee spiritually to the mountains. What do we gain in the mountains? Isaiah verse chapter 2 verse 2 and 3 tells us this and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say come ye let us go up to the mountain of the Lord the house of God of Jacob and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths here we see the, the purpose behind going up into the mountain where God can teach us His ways and lead us in His paths. And spiritually, we need to be led to the mountain of God. Where is that mountain in your life? It's the altar in your home where you, you bow down and pray, where you worship together as a family. God is calling us spiritually to flee to that place of refuge where we can guide, be guided by, the, by God. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 tells us this, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Here we can see that the angels pleaded for Lot to leave, escape to the mountain. He left. His family left with him. His wife looked back. She was lost. The daughters went up to the mountain with him also. But the Bible tells us that only Lot was saved. Many people can go up, can seek after God, but if they're not doing it by living faith, believing that God is going to do a transformation work within their lives, within their characters, then it's all in vain. It's all valueless. 
and I concluded with this one, one uh, word of inspiration here. Found in Faith and Works, page 78. You have to talk faith. You have to live faith. You have to act faith that ye may have an increase in faith. Let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, many of us here today have families that are divided, that are separated, that are far from you. Lord, you want to restore these families back to you. Lord, we understand that we're getting closer and closer to the end and we need to be drawn closer to you. And you're calling us to escape from the cities into the mountain, our spiritual journey that's going to lead us higher and higher to a higher standard. That higher standard, Lord, you require of us, you desire of us to have a unity within our home, to be bound by you in our homes, to surrender our wills and our ways to your wills and your ways. Lord, help us to abide in you. Help us to lead our children, lead our homes in the right path so that we can take advantage of the time, the opportunities you give us now to prepare our lives and prepare our household so that it's not just us, not just Lot that is saved, but we can be as Noah to the saving of ourselves and to the saving of our whole household. Let this be each, each and every single one of our prayers is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.